Well, beloved in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God's word for today that the Holy Spirit has caused St. Mark to record for us to know is essentially a teaching on Christian faithfulness. However, it's also a text that begins to set the stage for the end of all things. And usually these end, end time scriptures pique a lot of interest, both in and outside of the church, because if there's one thing in which the whole world seems curious about, it's in what is going to happen in the future. And this strong curiosity in future events is not a new thing. It has always been present in the minds of people throughout the ages. And what we'll see today is that it was also found in the minds of Christ's own disciples. However, the intent of this gospel lesson is not to draw attention to the curiosity people have regarding future events. Frankly, this text is not primarily focused on Christ's second coming, the end of the world, and judgment day either. That mostly comes in next week's gospel. However, that being said, within this text, we will find Jesus telling his own disciples and us to have our priorities in life in order and to be on guard and be prepared for all the terrible sinful things that will happen in the days leading up to Judgment Day. All those everyday life things that Christians have to deal with in a fallen and sinful world. Today's reading is from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 13, verse 1 through 13. I would ask again, if you're able, to rise out of respect for the glorious Gospel of Jesus Christ. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to Jesus, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speaks, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child. And children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. These are your holy words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us now in its truth. Your words are truth. Thank you. Please be seated. When we read the Bible, it's important for us to understand why God gave it to us, especially when dealing with texts like today. You see, the Bible is not intended to be used as a tool for those who are simply curious about future events. The Bible has instead been given to us as a means of God's grace where the Holy Spirit works through that word to show us God's plan of salvation in Jesus Christ. And because of that, 
The Bible's principal message is the repentance of sins and the forgiveness of them earned for us by Jesus dying on the cross and rising from the dead. So it is not the goal of the Bible to satisfy future curiosities or to give us a comprehensive history of the world. Instead, the Bible focuses on the history of Jesus and his people. And while the Bible certainly is a book of salvation history where men of history like Caesar Augustus and Governor Quirinius and Pontius Pilate and Herod the Great are mentioned, they are only mentioned when their story intersects the story of salvation in Christ. And that gets us into our lesson today. Because our text began with one of Jesus' disciples commenting to him about the beauty and size of the temple that Herod the Great had been expanding in Jerusalem. The actual work on this upgrade continued after Herod died and wasn't completed until 65 AD. But this expansion project was massive with approximately 10,000 lay laborers who continually worked on the common areas of the temple and over a thousand priests that did the upgrades to the sacred areas. And since it took so many decades to complete this project, every time Jesus and his disciples came to Jerusalem, there would have been new construction going on, new things to see, new areas to discover. So it would be very normal to look upon this structure with amazement and wonder. It's in this context that one of the disciples of Jesus said this to him, Teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. We see a parallel to this statement in Psalm 26, 8, which reads, O oh Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. And Psalm 102, 14 reads, For your servants hold her stones dear and have pity on her dust. Now, whichever disciple made these comments to Jesus about the stones of the temple and the wonderment of its structure, he was most likely expressing such a holy love for the temple as is described here in the Psalms. And the beauty and size of Herod the Great's Temple Mount was magnificent. It exceeded that of most of the seven wonders of the world. In fact, it was more than twice the size of the Acropolis in Athens. The Jewish historian Josephus wrote that it lacked nothing that the eye and the mind could admire. He said the marble shone with a fiery splendor so that when the eye gazed upon it, it turned away as from the rays of the sun. Josephus also recorded that the size of the foundation stones was enormous. Huge stone blocks, some measuring 37 feet long, 18 feet wide, and 12 feet high, all decorated with gold. So it was clearly one of the most impressive man-made structures of the ancient world. But loved ones, take a look around. <laughs> Look at this beautiful structure here. We have to worship God. And I'm sure Central Lutheran Church is similarly greatly loved by many in this congregation. But you know what? As beautiful and impressive as Central is, it's not going to last. That's a cue from Jesus. Mark 13 verse 2 reads, And Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Now this reply from Jesus must have been quite the blow. As his disciples are sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple admiring the magnificence of this structure, Jesus says there won't be one stone that will not be destroyed. And the event that Jesus is referring to happened in 70 AD, just five years after the completion of all the upgrades made to the temple, when the Roman army marched into Jerusalem and tore the temple down to the ground. 
Of course, this was a future event that the disciples knew nothing about. But hearing this, it must have been the verbal equivalent to a two by four across the head. But it's also true in a bigger sense, isn't it? Like I said a moment ago about our church, it's not going to last. Everything in this world is destined to be destroyed. Listen to these words found in 2 Peter 3 verse 10 which reads, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Friends, this is what is going to happen. It's just as the great apostle Paul said, the present form of this world is passing away. And that's why Jesus warns today in this gospel not to get too attached to the things of this world, even to something as magnificent as Herod the Great's temple or your own church building. Because all of it will pass away. After Jesus said that the temple would be destroyed and there would not going to be even any, anything left, it was going to be just brought to the ground and there wasn't going to be even one stone left of this colossal structure. Peter, Andrew, James, and John wanted the details. So they came to Jesus privately and asked him, Lord, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? In other words, Jesus, spill the beans. When will this occur? What's going to happen? But we see in the text that Jesus doesn't really answer their question, does he? Instead, he redirects their inquiry, as he often did, into the core of the matter with these words of caution. Mark 13, verse 5 and 6 reads, Jesus said, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. What Jesus here is teaching his disciples and us is that pure doctrine is vitally important. Jesus is warning us that the devil will constantly be sending false teachers into the world, sending wolves in sheep's clothing our way. And he is warning that these false teachers will be very clever. They will seduce and entice. They will strike at the heart of your emotion and stroke your self-esteem as they lead you astray. You see, just like at the time of Jesus, there have been and still are many would-be Christs in the world. From the Montanism movement in the second century to Mohammedism in the sixth and seventh centuries. Then we have the Mormons, the Jehovah Witnesses, the Scientologists, and the numerous other false religions and fringe cults and sects found the world over. Not to mention our own government, now seeking to control every aspect of our lives, thus becoming a would-be Christ. But it's not just the fringe cults or the government that are the problem. The tendency for even mainline churches and denominations to abandon the Word of God demonstrates the spiritual decay that Jesus spoke about in today's Gospel. From the church in Rome denying justification by faith alone, claiming the Pope is the head of the church, and stressing the necessity to pray to Mary and the saints who are dead, to the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, as well as the Presbyterian Church USA and others, calling and ordaining, openly practicing homosexuals and transgenders to be pastors. So yes, I'm afraid, there has been no lack of false Christs or folks claiming to be the one who is Jesus or who will finish the work that Christ began. And what all of these false teachers and false religions have in common? 
is that they lead people astray. They seduce them away from the straight and narrow path marked by the Word of God and lead them into worldly foolishness. That's simply just a lie. After Jesus warned about false Christs, he went on to emphasize the need for all Christians to be on guard and be prepared for all the things that are going to happen. Mark 13, verse 7 through 9 again reads, And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. But be on your guard. Jesus is saying here that because geopolitical conflicts and natural disasters are so common, they are not intended to determine the date of the end of the world. However, he makes clear that the frequency of such signs is to remind us that this world is not our final home. It will pass away. So what Jesus is warning is that you must at all times be on your guard and be prepared for the time of his return or your own death when you will pass from this world to the next. But Jesus also said that amid these signs, there will be many heartaches and troubles in life for true and faithful Christians. Troubles that include family divisions, sufferings, difficulties, and varying persecutions from the false Christs of this world, all because of your faith. Mark 13, 9 to verse 13 reads, But be on your guard. For they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. <laughs> Doesn't Christian life sound wonderful? <laughs> I want to be a Christian so everyone will hate me. Unfortunately, those of us who are true in our faith have experienced persecution already in this life, I'm guessing, even from within our own families. And that's why Jesus says to be on your guard. He says, watch out. Watch out for what? For the false teachings of this world that lure you away from him and for the rejection and persecution you will receive from many because of your faith in him. But I want to call your attention back to verse 10, which is a key verse in our text today. Jesus said to his disciples, and the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. In other words, Jesus says, before I return in glory, you've got work to do. You have to carry this good news, which is the cause of people hating you, out all over the place. Because it's through this gospel that I call and gather my beloved people. And they will hear and they will believe by the power of the Holy Spirit. If we were to read through to the end of Mark's gospel... He closes the last chapter by saying, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Matthew closes out his gospel by saying, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now both of these sections of Scripture represent the verse found in our chapter today that we, Christians, you and I, are still in. In other words, since the gospel has been proclaimed to us, we are now commanded as Christians by Jesus to keep his proclamation alive. The gospel must be proclaimed to all nations. So that means, friends, you and I are called by Jesus to keep that word going. Keep it going out to all people. Why? So they can be saved. And even in the light of suffering, persecution, even death, we must obey God rather than men. We must stay true to the Word of God because all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. We must stay true to the words of Jesus because He is the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except by Him. And we are to endure whatever this world has to throw at us. And no matter what, we Christians are to do our best to present ourselves to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. And friends, that's why God gave us the Bible, to equip the saints, you and me, for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes, but rather speaking the truth in love we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. My little flock, loved by God, we as Christians are to proclaim the gospel in truth to the world, and the world will hate us for doing so. But who cares? <laughs> because if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God the Father, who is indeed interceding for us right now. Who then shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? For it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No! In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So loved ones, because Jesus is interceding for us, and the Father hears that intercession and declares us righteous before him, you and I, as true and faithful Christians, can endure all sorts of trouble in this world. Because we know that God is not mad at us, 
that he smiles at us, that his face radiates at us, that he in fact loves us in Christ and calls us his own. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for Christ's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of the Lord who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So friends, no matter what this world throws at you, no matter the persecutions you may have to endure as a faithful and true Christian, if your family turns against you, if you are delivered over to the government, if you are beaten for your faith, if you are brought before the trials and delivered over for Christ's sake, don't be anxious. Don't be afraid. Stay faithful. Trust in Christ above all things. Not just in the good times when it's easy, but also in the bad times to come. Especially in the bad times to come. So loved ones, don't live your life as those who settle down in this age. Live as those who know that through the sorrows of creation and the persecutions of this life, the everlasting life of joy and triumph awaits you. So be faithful in your Christianity until death because Jesus says the one who endures to the end will be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son and whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Glorious Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for your words today. Allow the Holy Spirit now to open all hearts and minds to receive the truth of your gospel, that beautiful, rich, magnificent gospel. Then give us mouths to share that gospel and be workers approved, never ashamed, rightly handling your word and truth. And give it to our friends, our brothers, our sisters, our grandchildren, and all others who do not know you or claim to know you but really don't. This is our responsibility and your call to us as your children. Let us live up to that call. In Christ's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen.